Oh yes, uh, no more hearing me. We all want to hear you. So yeah, I'll see a voice actor without a microphone is like that. A voice actor without a microphone. Is like it's just not, uh, just not, not all. I mean, we are, all we have are our voices. You know, I'm noticing there's a lot of face actors here today. You know, people from, from, uh, from Grimm and from Disney shows. And they have an added advantage. You know what they look like. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so flattered that some of you know what I do and who I am, and then when I walk in the room, you do what you do. So, you know, because I, it's a life of invisibility, anonymity, which is in its own way kind of comfortable, but also, you know, I don't get the best tables at the, the, at the restaurants, the rooms don't do parts for me. But it's a nice, it's a great way to make a living. And I'm, uh, I've been, uh, I, I believe I've been really blessed to end up in this business as a voice actor, mainly, for the fact that I get to meet lovely people like you when I do these cons. You know, when I come out to these things, you guys remind me, when you say to me, and the, the most common comment I get is, you're the voice of my childhood. When you guys see, I thank you for bobbing. You say that to me, you make my middle age better. You make, you make me know that I've done something that, that, that counts for something, you know, that I've helped. You know, maybe I helped you through a hard homework session, or maybe I helped one or two people tell me I helped you through some teenage, you know, adolescent depression, and, and, and you know, myself and the 87 other people who made Pinky in the Brain, obviously, it's not just me. But it gives me a great feeling, and I'm glad, that, I'm glad that for the longevity that comes with this career as well. So I get to do it for a long, long time. Instead of being on a sitcom for maybe four years, and then, you know, like the, the neighbor who does impressions, and then you never, you never see me again. So <laughs> this is been great. The actor likes to work, and uh, I don't have to worry about hair lighting and makeup, but I just get to get behind a microphone and create characters. And that's the, that's the greatest thing I have to ask for. Well, keep working for 27 years. Um, I was just saying to my assistant that I've been the voice of Toucan Sam for 27 years. And I, I can't believe that. I got the job in 1987, and I've been following my nose. <laughs> Two residual checks. <laughs> so, anyway, this is supposed to be a Q and A, not me rambling on and on about myself. This isn't the meeting with narcissists anonymous. So, um, you guys have any questions for me? And Nick will come to you with the microphone. You can ask him on the mic, and I would be all good. If you hear yourself, or you want to imagine? You know, I've trained myself to know the to know the actual sound of my voice. Most people, um, when they hear themselves on playback, don't you all like think your voices are much deeper than that? Yes. <laughs> right. Or, yes. When I hear myself played back, I've now trained myself all day long to hear myself as I actually sound. I've canceled out the bass response of my own skull, so I'm not surprised when I hear myself. You know, as a, when I was a little kid. Yeah, sure. I used to think I sounded like a little girl. My father was in radio, and he brought me down to the station, and I, I, you know, I spoke into the microphone, and then played it back, and I was like, "Daddy, I sound like a girl." <laughs> of course, when I talk like that, I do sound like a girl, even though I'm 56 years old. <laughs> I sound like a girl, don't I? Okay. So anyway, um, but. When I started doing this, one of the first things I started to do was work at home with my own sort of tape setup. I mean, I was 16 years old, and I've got, you know, saved and saved with my, my job cleaning the bakery at Loblaws Supermarket in uh, Willowdale, Ontario. And I saved and saved for a very good cassette recorder, so almost studio quality cassette recorder. And I started working with voices and listening to myself on playback and comparing it to what I'm hearing on TV. I mean, that's the way I used to work, just to sit there and just study copy and imitate. So I, I just, yeah, I don't, I'm not surprised when I hear myself. Now, when they, when they, you know, play with my voice a little bit electronically and make me a little crisper and a little, like, I, I don't know, how many of you know that I'm the voice of Lexus? Yeah. That I do all the Lexus versions. Yeah. The 2014 Lexus GS. <laughs> Thank you. They, 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 bring, they make my voice a little more present. They take a little of the bottom off. They put a little crispness in there. And I, when I hear that back, I, I often will you know, say to the guys as I come out of the booth and they're still missing it, I'll say to Bob and Bruce, the two engineers I work with, 
Thank you for making me sound like a real professional television announcer. <laughs> you know, so there's little things they can still do. But for the most part, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm comfortable with the sound of my own voice, which might be the first thing in being a voice out. You've got to learn to be comfortable with that. So yes, that's... Any other questions? Yes? Well, first off, now I'm on Alexis. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> your support characters, um, are you surprised that, like, for example, uh, the principal in The Critic, or Calculon, or um, Lur, were you surprised when those characters, like, especially Calculon and Lur, when they became more popular and got their own storyline and stuff like that? Or, yeah, I mean, I was very, I was very gratified. Um, Morbo, more go with the newscaster. <laughs> yeah, we, we've uh, the writers have always toyed with the idea of let's follow more of a home you know, from the studio and see what his life was like. But the, I think the greatest glimpse they could have given Morbo was in um, 300 Big Boys when uh, they're all at that reception and that, that Nixon gives everybody $300 and they're at the reception. It's just a little passing shot, you know. And we see, in fact, it's one of my photos on my table. It's. Morbo's wife, who's of the same species as him, adjusting his bow tie for his tuxedo, and he's going, it's fine, it's fine. I will destroy you! <laughs> and I think that's all we need to know about Morbo's private life. That, that is the, the, the great line, uh, you know, how's the family, Morbo? Belligerent and numerous. <laughs> just assume that, you know, this is Morbo is just hatching them like crazy. Um, but, but the Lur storylines have been really interesting. Even though the voices are very similar, they're very different characters in my head. And I know that if you listen to the commentary track, it's kind of become a running gag where, you know, I, at least once a, once a commentary I say, Lur and Morbo sound completely different. You know, it's a gag, it's a joke, it's part of my obnoxious character on the commentary tracks. Um, but the truth of the matter is, they sound almost exactly the same. But in my head, they're different guys with very different wants. And, and there is a slightly different sound. I pitch Morbo just a little lower, and I give him much better diction uh, because he's a newscaster. And Lur is just a little more casual sounding because what the hell, he's a king. Uh, Bowman Crop for CIA, and he doesn't really have to answer anybody except in the window. But <laughs> the, the, the episode, Lur Reconcilable and the Differences, was actually one of the best storylines on midlife crisis I've ever seen on any show. And, um, I was very honored to have been, and shocked to have been nominated for Outstanding Voiceover Performance uh, at the Emmy Awards in 2011 for that performance. I played two characters. I played Lur for the entire episode, it really was a Lur section of the episode. And I played Orson Welles' head in a jar. <laughs> Why they gave that part to me, I have no idea. And I went to the Emmys that year, and you know, it was just certain that it was just going to go to I mean, I was up against later to win an Oscar, Christopher Plummer in that category. And somehow or another, look, they, they awarded me. So I won the Emmy that year for that part. So I got, you got to love a guy like Lerner, you know, because he brings you an Emmy. But he's also kind of a deep, rich character. You know, he is, he's a king, and yet he's, he's set upon, you know. At his, uh, put upon him in his own home. I built this castle with my own two slaves. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, and he's, he's an egomaniac, and yet, you know, he's, you can tell at the center of him he's really suffering from some low self esteem. So I, there was some richness in death. So I love when, when a secondary character, or, or Principal Mobutu, you know, he was just a lot of fun. I don't think we ever gave him a storyline on the critic, but I just loved playing him because I basically was doing um, Jeffrey Holder. The, uh, the, I don't know if any of you remember the 7-Up guy from the, from the 1970s. Crispin Dean, no caffeine. Ha 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 He was also a live and let die. You know, he was famous for that, that big toothy laugh of his. So that, that's basically what I do for principal Kabuki. It's a lot of fun to be the secondary voice guy. You know, what they call the, um, the utility voice guy is the name for it in, in uh, Simpsons and Futurama speak. Um, because you get to stretch. I get to play. I've done, s there was somebody with a lot more time in his hands than me who did a website of the voices of Futurama. And I think I've done, at last count, 72 different characters, <laughs> including regulars, recurrings, and one offs. 72 different characters. And, you know, you just get 
challenged by coming in and David X. Cohen said, okay, so this week you're a porno dealing alien. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, I went so I'm a porno demon alien. What do you want? You know, and I thought he was never going to come back, and he actually came back in the last episode. Um, so uh, we we're actually talking about spinning him off into his own show. <laughs> so, you know, actually, the closest we ever came to a spinoff, there was, and this made the web, so you probably already know this. There was almost a Zach and Kid spinoff from uh, Futurama. Oh, wow. But I think they just felt like, okay, so it's these two guys exploring space instead of the Planet Express crew exploring space. It would have been fun to find out who some of those guys are on, on board the Nimbus, especially the guy who yells, You suck! <laughs> John Roger did the greatest you suck, you know, for uh, when Zap was addressing all of the men in the back. But I, I, just, I would have liked to have seen that show come about, not just for the paycheck, but because I think that would have been a fun world to explore. And their interplay, Billy and I playing Zap and, and Kip, they're such an odd couple. Uh, and I, but I love playing, again, he was going to be just a tertiary character and getting his own storylines. They made him a romantic character on the show, you know. He's a bit again put upon but he's the one who you know really loves amy and he'll do anything for her and he actually got to be kind of heroic in that episode with buffalo Row. you know uh and i thought their their chemistry would have been interesting to explore you know as the as this you know odd couple kind of thing um i don't want to put you on the spot but i, I know I mentioned i'm up here with a microphone <laughs> How much more on the spot can I be? I'm, I'm, I'm always so impressed by the, the gaseous belches, these deep, huge sounds, that, and they make you do them all the time. It seems like Futurama. Yeah. Is there only, only someone with, with, with a higher voice and soft skin felt that way? <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead. But it, uh, it, I mean, what's your technique for that? I mean, my my technique for that is is lots of diet coke. <laughs> no, my technique for that is all vocal. I'm, 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 uh, I'm happy to report. For my wife, uh, I use very little actual vocal when I do the belching for, say, what I did for uh, Wacko on Adam and the Axe, Wacko, Wacko. Oh, and I did. Yeah, the great, it's a great Wacko rod. You know, it's the Hollywood Bowl, and, and it's the big jar of seltzer that Dot sprays into his mouth, and. Jack goes at the piano and he steps out and goes, <laughs> That's a totally vocal effect. There's no actual gas other than the carbon dioxide that escapes when anybody talks. I, I rasp my, my voice box, but I also create a big echo chamber. I don't know, for some reason, I can make my tongue do you know, strange things, and I create two echo chambers in my cheeks and under under here, and that's where the the, di the depth of that sound comes. And I just close off everything and just let it all resonate in there. And it becomes it sounds like a belch or a vomit or any number of savory things. Let's go eat. <laughs> any other questions? Okay. Let's just pass the microphone. Much, so. <laughs> Consider it like a bomb or something. <laughs> Well, when's the first time you ever remember doing Orson Welles? Ah, well, Neil, you, you actually have Neil Ross to thank for my Orson Welles. Uh, well, uh, um, I was, uh, he gave me a tape of uh, Orson Welles doing a, a Frozen Peas commercial. <laughs> really like it. A frozen Peas commercial in the late 70s in England, and it had made the rounds of recording engineers. It used to be only recording engineers had this stuff, and occasionally they'd share it with their favorite uh, voice actors and radio announcers. But it was a bunch of outtakes of Orson record doing this Frozen Peace commercial and getting very irritated with the directors because he was being over-directed. He gave me this take, and um, I listened to it over and over and over again. And I'll say that Phil Proctor from the Fireside Theater had also given me the tape, but I had lost his. So I, it was out of my sight for about a year. Um, and then when Neil gave it to me, I held on to his for dear life. And I, I listened to it over and over and over again. 
and backwards. I mean, I, I, I recorded it on the other side. That's how insane I was for this thing. So all I, I had it on a continuous loop. I was fascinated with every facet of this man. And I began to, I started out going, my goodness, that's just so, how dare he speak to directors this way? And as I listened and as I began, as I began working voiceover, I began to go, he's right. <laughs> there is too much directing around here. No way. There is no way. <laughs> so I memorized the thing backwards and forwards. But uh, I, I, really, the first time I did it was in my car. Just driving, it's just like the way you'd sing along to a song, I would go, Get me a jury and show me how you can say in July and I'll go down. <laughs> <laughs> Along with Orson. So, I, so much so that when we did the episode of Pinky and the Brain called Yes Always, which was a cleaned up, you know, bad words taken out version of that, apparently the timing with which we recorded it was so dead on that a guy took the animation from the episode Yes Always, where Brain does a Frozen Peace commercial and sets it to the actual tape of Orson, and it syncs up perfectly. <laughs> it's wacky. It's really wacky. It's almost like a, like a tool thing. I mean, it was weird, you know. The, we, didn't, we didn't need to adjust the animation at all. There's, there's, it's all the lines. It's amazing. So that, the Orson became you know, deeply ingrained, and I, and I often thought to myself, well, when am I ever going to use this voice? <laughs> Nice one was the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or that was the real horse that I have to say. It was I think it was the very last, the very last uh, voiceover job he ever did. He did go on. Uh, he went on the Merv Griffin show the day he died, and that you can actually get that, see that on YouTube. And it's a little eerie to know that he would die several hours later after doing this this terrific last appearance. So. Um, I, I have tremendous respect for the man. I mean, I've never seen Citizen Kane, the only film that he had complete creative control over. It's a work of genius, and uh, Hollywood did not treat him well uh, from there forth. I think because he dared to say, my vision's best, and I, I, I know it's best for my movies. But um, <clears throat> anyway, so that was my, that, that's where I began to, uh, that's my first Orson Welles experience. And it's, it's, he's treated me well. There's, I, I used to be, and I, you know, kids, if you smoke, quit now. And if you haven't started, never start, because then you won't ever have to quit. <laughs> so I, I used to be a voracious cigar smoker. And one of the things, one of the positive memories I have is, is that when Orson Welles died, his, uh, his assistant actually came into the cigar store where I, where I frequent and sold. Orson's last box of Cuban cigars. And I bought them. Like that. So, I mean, I like to think that maybe uh, somehow or another the spirit of Orson <laughs> entered me one puff at a time. But I can't think about it. That's a little eerie, especially when you consider the cigar. I don't know. Big long cigar. Anyway, um, so that's it. That's the Orson thing. Anybody else? Who's got the mic now? I have the mic. Hey! The other girl's mustard. Um, how much uh, did you get to do? I don't recall our uniforms being <laughs> blue and what color is that? Orange? orange. I wouldn't quite call that orange. <laughs> More of a puce. <laughs> anyway, um, sorry, how much uh, improvising did you get to do on any of your lines, or was it just stick with the script? Or I, I'm a big stick with the script guy. I tend to believe that the writers, I, I love writers, because mainly I, mainly because I can't do it, I'm trying. Um, I don't have the discipline for it. Or the, or the ability to, to watch things, you know, come out of my fingers and have them suck. You know, <laughs> you have to be willing to suck and then, you know, wipe it away and start again and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. So I'm a big, a big booster of writers. And uh, so I don't really play with the scripts too much. You know, I, I like to just stick with the written word. And I've been so lucky that I've gotten to work with some of the best writers that have ever put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard in this business. You know, the team on Futurama, the team on The Critic, the team on Pinky and the Brain and Animaniacs, uh, Arch and, the, and the team on The Simpsons, which I'm, I'm proud to say I've, I've become such a frequent guest voice on there that uh, I'm like coming up right, right up behind Joe Mantegna uh, in terms of like, you know, most frequent guest appearances. Um, I'm just so, I'm so honored to be a part of that. 
Um, there's no need for me to tinker in any way, shape, or form. So I just did, I stick with the script. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, oh yeah, what was uh, your first paying voice job, and what were you doing before that? <coughs> United States of Canada. United States of Canada, Mexico, Panama, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, if, you, if Paulson and I were together, he'd be, he'd be off. But um, <laughs> the very first, very, very first paid voiceover job I ever did was in Canada. At the age of 19 years old, it was a, um, it was a show called, it was a one-off special called Easter Fever uh, with Garrett Morris from Saturday Night Live and now two little girls as the Easter Bunny. And uh, John Candy did a guest voice in it. I mean, this is before any of them were doing movies. And uh, Catherine O'Hara. And, you know, they'd seen me at Yuck Yucks Comedy Club in Toronto doing all these impressions. And the idea was it was a roast of the Easter Bunny. So they had Steve Martin. You know, I am a wild and crazy horse, and Don Don Rattles. You know, were you born that ugly? Anyway, gang. Um, you know, these were the lines that I had to say in the, in the, in the show, and so I did like six voices, and uh, I was like, uh, you know, that was. You want to talk about uh, hearing my voice? Yeah, I heard my voice many times. But the first time that was the first time I'd ever seen my voice come out of the lips of an animated character. When I saw that, I went, oh, I gotta do more of this. this is, that's the closest thing there is to magic. <laughs> you know, so you're, you're almost trans, transformed, as it were. Since we're Transformers and the convention. Um, you know, I was transformed into an animated rattlesnake and an animated horse and uh, an animated Easter bat. You know, because they're auditioning people to take over for the Easter bugs. I, I was curious for that. And, you know, so that was the very first thing I ever did. And then uh, the first thing I did when I came to the States, I did uh, a Southwest Airlines commercial with Hector Elizondo. That was my first paid gig voiceover in, uh, in, uh, in, in Los Angeles. So it was my first job. And then, and then the for, for, first TV series, it was Inspector Gadget as chief. That was that was like the that was the the, the, the pebble starting to become a boulder. You know, it started with that, went into real Ghostbusters, then just you know a few more things. Uh, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes I did for a couple of years, and then into Tiny Toons, Animaniacs, Tasmania, and Futurama, Pink the Brain and Critic. A long and storied career. <laughs> <laughs> All of one little question. Anything else? Any other questions? Uh, did you receive any like formal vocal training, like, or did you just? You said you got a really good tape recorder and you just listened to your voice over and over. Was that your your training, or did you I've ever? Never, yeah, I've never studied anything uh, voice-wise except. I'm out of the didactic in this area, but I've always been able to do impressions and voices even as a little kid. You know, I used to do comparative back in commercials. It comes from a strong desire not to be me. And, you know, so I, I, uh, I, but I was always, even as a little kid, doing, you know, fuck around, fuck and you know. The Turkish Cappy commercial was one that I, that I used to be able to do by memory. Uh, so, no, I've always been able to do this and I've never studied. And yet I tell everybody to study because I, I'm the luckiest SOB in the business. I don't know how I got here. And people say, how do you get into it? I go, well, I guess what you do is you fail at stand-up comedy and uh, you know, <laughs> come uh, depressed and uh, hide out and don't, you know, don't do anything for two years, but you know, then somebody hires you to do a show and come out of your house and do the show. You know, I mean, I think it's just, it's, I don't know how to, you know, my path has been a very different one. But I, I, I always recommend studying with Working voice actors, if you were, if you've got um, an, an industry here, uh, have any have any top kind of the people who work, or I know that Houston has got uh, you know a working voiceover industry. There's things like the Learning Annex. There's a wonderful um, uh, website by my friend Neil Bradley Baker called uh, I Want to Be a Voice Actor.com, and he's got a lot of lessons on there. You know, it was much better. I mean. Those who can do, and also those who can, at least in our business, teach. And he can teach. I am not a good teacher. Um, if I said to you the things I say to myself when I'm working and teaching myself, I'd have to be arrested. 
Yeah. <laughs> that sucks. That's terrible. Do it better. Uh, what are you doing in this business? These are the things I say to myself as I work. What am I doing? How do you how do you get paid? I don't understand. How does anybody pay you? <laughs> now these are the things that my head feels while I'm doing a Lexus commercial. <laughs> Still to this day. Yes, sir. Do you have any uh, friendships with other voice actors from a lot of your jobs? I do. You know, it's funny. I, I was uh, this this facet of the business is people buy some of the nicest human beings in the entertainment industry. We really can't afford to have egos because nobody knows what we look like. We can be replaced tomorrow. You know, if I was to have gotten to, in fact, for those of you that saw Yes Always, you know at the end of that episode, Brain decides to walk off out of the recording studio, and Andrea Romano playing herself is outside auditioning like 50 brain-sized voice actors. <laughs> and she's saying, is anybody else ready to audition part of the brain? And they all go, yes, always, and 50 of them. And, you know, that's the thing. We can't, we don't, we don't have big egos. We are, we are nice people, you know, good people, kind people. So yeah, I'm friendly with a ton of folks in my industry. Most especially Rob Paulson. Rob and I playing Pinky in the Brain. Over the years, we've developed a real friendship where we actually text each other, you know, a couple of times a day with something funny or a story. We talk on the phone at least once a week, and when we go ready to go and get dinner. And when we come out on these things, it's like a little mini vacation for us, a chance for us to catch up and go out and, 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 and grab a bike and just have a great time for three days. And, uh, you know, yeah, beautiful, beautiful folks in this business. As, as you'll find as you meet us, you know. So I've got a lot of friendships in this business. Very sweet people. I've got to spend a, had a terrific dinner last night with Michael Bell, Neil Ross, and David Soboloff, and, uh, and, and um, Oh, who's my crop? Ray Berger and Jeffrey Combs. For the animator. <laughs> but this one will play all of them if you, uh, you like Italian food. You know, hit all of those. It's really wonderful. So, but we had a great talk. We didn't talk about the business side uh, of the entire time. We talked about life, and marriages, and children, and that sort of thing. We're just like real people. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, has there been a character that, or a voice that you wish you'd saved for something else, or where you saw it and you went, oh, that didn't quite work? That's a good question. Um, you know, I'll have to think about that. Let's all meet back here next week. <laughs> My question was about your experience uh, working with video game voiceovers as opposed to television and movies. If there is any difference in your process and what you think about the technology behind video games now and allowing voice actors to work. Well, the technology, what hits the screen is amazing. When I was working on Arkham City, I mean, it was just the, the movement of the characters and the depth and the richness of the images. It's almost cinematic. I mean, we're almost at the point now where that's a movie. Um, uh, in terms of the work, though, I mean, there's a big difference between on-camera work and, and, and voiceover work, and especially game voiceover work. You know, you spend most of your day waiting to go on and shoot a, you know, 48, 50-second, two-minute scene. And you're, you know, at your trailer, you're at the you know, craft table, whatever. And it's a lot of sitting around waiting. With voiceover, you're in there and you are hammering the lines up on uh, on video games. And it is, you know, get, get a, like a, a small city phone book with a game, uh, with the lines for games. And it can be very taxing, especially since a good third of that is your character's death done as many ways as the game has it. Short, medium, and long. You know, I, you know, you can fall from, you're falling from a, a very small cliff, you're falling from a 50 foot cliff, you're falling from a 200 foot cliff, and you're screaming, okay, you've been shot, okay, you've been shot five times, you're, you're on fire, okay, now it's just a little fire, your ass is on fire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, so, yeah, it's a very, very, 
intensive experience of recorded video games. And there's so many responses. And because uh, your character, it's like a tree. You, know? you get to a point, and you left, right, go straight. Uh, in terms of the characters, you know, what happens to them. So you have to be able to play all kinds of different attitudes at various stopping points in the game. Um, so you could have just played the character's death, and then you're playing your character going on to be the triumphant character in the, in the, in the, in the game. Um, so it really runs the game. It's a very intensive experience to, uh, to, do, a voice, to do voice acting for a video game. I, I actually do turn down a lot of video games because I roasted my throat on uh, early games and was unfit to work for about a month, and I had to turn down you know, auditions and jobs for one job. And I just thought, that's not good math. One job you know, subtracts 20 jobs? No. So now I only do video games where there's a minimum of screaming and death, and that will make me look cool with my son. <laughs> um, anything, anything to do with Batman, anything to do with Star Wars or Star Trek, I'll, I'll do it. But other than that, I, I, just, I don't do the war games. I, I, you know, it's just it's too much for his throat. I have a quick follow-up, just real quick, just yes. yes or no. Uh, have you ever been asked? Can't you see there are thousands of people making that? <laughs> there are tens of people. <laughs> oh, go ahead, please. Um, just as a quick follow-up, because I'm a huge Nintendo fan, so I just got to know, has Nintendo ever asked you to do a voice, or is there a voice from their franchises that you've sort of been like, I could, I could do this character justice, or something like that? Not that I know of. No, I don't think I've ever been approached by Nintendo, no. no. Um, I mean, like, for, for the DS? Like yeah, well, because even, like, their Wii, the, any of the newest titles that they do, because they're giving voices to, like, Mario now, and, yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't been approached to do those, no, not yet, not yet. Before he asked me a question. Game, game, buddy. Yes, there we go. Gotcha. How long did it take before you drove your wife crazy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a long, a long, long story. You, you, you me, and my therapist can sit down. <laughs> And her therapist. <laughs> so they probably start punching each other. Um, <laughs> she's always been my biggest booster in terms of what I do. It's the other things about her that, that about me that make them crazy. But I've got I've got a lot of quirks. Let me just say that I'm just a little bit quirky around around the house. I'm very like that goes there and it can't be moved. And don't touch that. Okay, this pile here, I can't touch that until I go through. I'm a little OCD on such things. And yet the kitchen has to be spotless and immaculate. Very bizarre. Um, those things drive her a little nuts. My wife and I actually uh, have been separated for 11 years, and just around uh, Christmas time this year, we uh, started dating again. And uh, so we still live, we still live in separate houses, but we are in love, and we will uh, we will be uh, seeing how it goes. Right. We spend a lot of time together. And we're each other's best friend. It always had been, even through the other years of separation. We were always there for each other, and uh, I always will be, no matter what happens. But yeah, my wife and I are falling in love again, so it's all fantastic. That's why I call her my wife now, instead of my estranged wife. I actually had this really long title for it. I said my estranged, by uh, living apart, by whatever the hell we are. Yeah. <laughs> so but now she's my wife. What's your favorite voice to do and your most difficult voice? Okay. Uh, my favorite voice is the brain. <laughs> you can't spend six years with a character who, who basically his, his every want is every want you had. I mean, he wants to take over the world. I and every actor who ever moved to Los Angeles wants to take over the world of show business. I mean, we all, we're all egomaniacs, every last one of us. And so, and we're, and we're constantly thwarted, you know? And, and, you know, only one guy gets to be Brad Pitt. You know? Uh, you know, so, so the grandiose schemes of every actor. Uh, so I, I related very much to the character. Uh, plus getting to play that, you know, doing that deep, that rich, ringing voice was tremendous fun because one can truly savor an insult. <laughs> It must be inordinately taxing to be such a boob. <laughs> the 
if I could reach you, I would hurt you. <laughs> so, so in terms of a character, he's, he's my favorite. But the most difficult is, is Yosemite Sam. Um, he really rips me up. Uh, as I said, you know, I did one game, he was a Yosemite Sam. I, I had like 50 pages of lines for, for Yo Sam. And, he went to home. and uh, to do it right, because there's a lot of guys that can sort of do them, but they're, they're smart enough not to go all the way. Only Mel Blanc, if you read his autobiography, he talks about um, only doing Yosemite Sam on Friday, so he has the weekend to recover. And that's kind of my rule, too. Because Yosemite Sam is all the way here. Oh, thanks, rabbits! <laughs> <laughs> Four hours. <laughs> when you do it right, you gotta go, you know, what's to the wall, you know? So, that's the, so those, that's, that's the short answer to that question. You know, so, yeah, I love him. He's a lovable, irascible character. A lot of fun. Anyone else? With a kiss of I find you like a fifth student. <laughs> the force is with you, question asker. That's not the first time you took verification if you're pinky and the brain? Yeah. If you want verification if I'm pinky and the brain? Yes, or if you were just one, the voice of one of them? I was only the brain. Oh. Rob Paulson, a tremendously talented voice actor, uh, and uh, also known as Donatello from uh, the... Uh, and, and Raphael, he's actually now half of the Ninja Turtles, he's Raphael in, in the new iteration, uh, is, uh, is Pinky, and he's my partner in crime. Yeah. And also, when you actually record these, do you have to do it just one line at a time, just several times before you decide, oh, right, that's good enough? Uh, well, no, we, we generally read it like a radio play, and we, we're stopped by the director only when there's, a, you know, something she wants to do again. So we, we read it the same way you'd read a radio play. In fact, we've done a couple of episodes we've, we've read through with only maybe two or three breaks. But uh, so, you know, then there's other times where you only do a page. But we try to do get a, get a flow of the scene and what's happening, at least on Vicky and the Brain. There are, other, there are other jobs where you do go one line at a time. Disney uh, feature tends to work that way, you know, where you just do one or two lines and then stop them. And they, they're very, they're very uh, focused on just getting that particular line right. So. And you're alone in the studio, which is my favorite way to work is ensemble style, which we did on Futurama and Maniacs, Pinky and the Brain, the critic. Uh, thanks for coming, Mr. Paulson. I just want to know what you're doing tonight. <laughs> 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 Mr. Paulson? Mr. Paulson, are you? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, um, what was the question? I was just asking, what are you going to be doing tonight? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I do every night, my friend. <laughs> Attend the river walk and then <laughs> take over the world. <laughs> It's not so much a question. Yes, I just kind of want you to do the frozen bees commercial. <laughs> the frozen bees commercial? Yeah. <laughs> we have young people here. I can't. There are already nerds in it. So. All right. <laughs> Setting is a recording studio in England. In the days, in the 1970s, where there was no ISDN, Internet Subscriber Data Network. There was no internet to, that could be accessed. There was no Skype. So they flew you. They flew you first class. So they flew Orson Welles first class to England to record a series of commercials for a line of foods there by a company called Finders. Finders Frozen Foods and still exists. And he, so he's there and he's got two directors he's working with. I'll try, to, I'll try to play everybody. And I'm sorry, young man, you're going to hear a word or two. I'm sure you've never heard. <laughs> <laughs> we know a remote farm in Lincolnshire where Mrs. Buckley lives. Every July, peas grow there. 
Do you really mean that? Uh, yes, I stopped about half a second later. Don't you think you really want to say July all the snow is meant the fun of it? If you could make it all those when that shot disappears, I think it would make much fun. I think it's so nice that you see the snow covered field and say every July piece go there. We know a remote farm in Lincolnshire where Mrs. Buckley lives. Every July, peas grow there. We aren't even in the fields, you see. No, no, no. We're talking about them growing and she's picked them. I don't understand you then. What must be over for July? Well, when we get out of that snowy field. But I was out. We were on a can of peas, a big dish of peas when I said July. You are? Yes, always. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always past that. That's about where I said July. Uh, could you emphasize a bit in, in July? Why, well, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Sorry, there's no known way of saying an English sentence in which you begin a sentence with in and emphasize it. Get me a jury and show me how you can say in July and I'll go down on you. <laughs> it's just idiotic if you'll forgive me for my saying so. That's just stupid in July. I'd love to know how you emphasize it in, in July. Impossible. Meaningless. I think all they were thinking about was they didn't want... He isn't thinking. <laughs> also, could you do just one last one? It was my fault. I said in July. If you could leave it every July. You didn't say it. He said it. Your friend. <laughs> Every July? And you don't really mean every July? That's bad copy, it's in July. Of course it's every July. There's too much directing around here. <laughs> Norway, fingers Norway, fish fingers Norway. We know a certain fjord of Norway, near where the cart gather in great shores. There, Jans st stand. Shit. <laughs> uh, a fraction more that shows that you roll the ground very nicely. They roll it around and I have no more time. You don't know what I'm up against. Because it's full of things that are only correct because they're grammatical, but they're tough on the ear. You see, this is a very weary one. It's unpleasant to read. Unrewarding. Because Spindus freeze the card at sea and then add a crumb crisp coat. Oh, oh, that's tough. Crumb crisp coating. <laughs> I think because of the way it's written, we need to break it up because it's, it's not as conversationally written. Lose the word. Take crumb out? Good. Here under protest is beef burgers. <laughs> we know a little place in the American Far West where Charlie Briggs chops up the finest prairie fed beef and tastes each. This is a lot of shit, you know. <laughs> Give some that. You want one more? You we'll missed the first beef actually completely. What do you mean missed it? Well, you're emphasizing prairie fed, but you can't emphasize beef. That's like his wanting to emphasize in before July. Come on, fellas, you're losing your heads. I wouldn't direct any living actor like this in Shakespeare the way you do this. It's impossible. Of course, you did six last year, and, and by far and away the best. I, I think I know the, re the right reading for this is the one I'm giving you. <laughs> I spent 20 times more for you people than any other commercial I've ever made. You were such pests. <coughs> now what is it you want in your depths of your ignorance? What is it? <laughs> Whatever it is you want, I can't deliver because I just don't see it. <coughs> that was absolutely fine. It really was. You, you, it isn't worth it. Don't mind it. <laughs> Is there anybody that, uh, in the business that you have worked with that you want to work with? Yes. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would give, uh, I would, I would give uh, a tooth, because I got 36 more. Um, I would love to work with John Cleese in some oh, yeah. uh, I've already gotten to work with Eric Idle. Uh, he played both of Pinky's parents on Pinky and the Brain. So I've got one-sixth of Monty Python down. And, you know, unfortunately, four more to go, Grant Chapman left us. Uh, but uh, I would love to work with Cleese. He's a hero. He's a master of timing. His, his brilliance, just, just, I mean, in terms of just his, what he knows, his, what, his philosophy of life, I can't, you know, I'm just, I'm in awe of the man. Absolutely in awe. So that's, that's, that's on my bucket list. If I could just do something with Cleese and meet him. Shake his hand and have him not make me too great a fool. It would be a great thing. 
and hi. You can just shout out. Can you do the voice of Yes, my friend. Will you help me and my latest plan to take over the world? <laughs> Pinky's in the corner buttering his feet at Anthony Labs. I need a new partner. You and I will rule together. Yes, my chances just have to improve. <laughs> We can do one more. <laughs> Has there been a, a voice character that you've inherited that you that you were like kind of scared to do that you worried that you're not gonna live up to the original? Yeah. Uh, in 1987, uh, there was a series called Popeye and Son that Hanna Barbera did, and they had created it with um, Jack Mercer in mind. Uh, who was the voice of Popeye for 50 years. Oddly enough, he was the second voice of Popeye. If you watch, I think there are about 10 or 11 black and white Depression era cartoons where Popeye's voice is actually kind of different. And that guy is the original Popeye. His name was uh, Bill Costello, and he was a vaudeville performer named Red Pepper Sam. Because he sang everything down here, really. Yeah. So, you know, when you get the ones where he sounds like this, so that's actually... That's actually the original Popeye voice. That's Bill Costello. And then... Um, Bill Costello went off to serve in, uh, in, in World War II. So Mercer, who was a storyboard artist for, uh, uh, oh goodness. No, I can't believe this. I can't remember the name of the studio. The Fleischer Studios. So uh, he was a storyboard artist for the Fleischer Studios. And when he pitched stories, he'd do a pretty close impression of what, of what uh, Red Pepper Sam was doing. So when, uh, when Costello left, Mercer filled in, and he ended up keeping his job for 50 years. And he was a gentleman, a joy to work with, and everybody loved him. And so they thought, wouldn't it be funny to finally have Popeye get married to Olive Oil and bring him into the 80s, you know? So Olive Oil had like, uh, you know, she had the leg warmers, she was taking aerobics classes. <laughs> Popeye had retired, he, you know, instead of the uh, sailor's uniform, he wore a Hawaiian shirt, and they had a 10-year-old son. And uh, Jack Mercer unfortunately passed away while the show was in development, but it still went on ahead. And I was lucky enough to get the job. Um, again, another throat ripping voice, very difficult. Um, but what I worried about more than how painful the voice was was, am I going to be able to step into this iconic character's shoes? Now, luckily, most of the voice, most of the episodes centered around Popeye Jr. and Bluto's son. Uh, so. Uh, I was very lucky enough. Uh, Bluto's son, I believe, was yeah. Nancy Cartwright played Bluto's son on the show. So, and this was pre Simpsons. So I was um, I was lucky that each episode kind of began with, "Well, son, what adventure are you off on today? Don't forget to take your spinach." <laughs> and the rest of the show was the kids surfing because it was a seaside town. And then you know he'd come back, he'd win the adventure, whatever it was, a sea monster. And I just look at the camera and go, "That's my boy." So after 13 episodes, of course, you know, the show got canceled. Uh, I take personal responsibility for it. <laughs> but we they didn't get, we, we were making the first 13 before it went on the air. But our last episode, they decided to give us a Popeye and Bluto. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, Bluto, Bluto and Popeye went off and, and uh, fought the sea hag. And so that one was really a treat. And again, I thought, well, all right, I'm comfortable. The last 12 episodes have been a rehearsal. We actually do the interplay between Popeye and Pluto, but I did find myself always feeling as though I could never quite fill Jack Mercer's shoes. And of course I could. You know, the man I had with the character for 50 years. But hopefully I did it some justice. Great, well, thank you so much for attending the uh, panel today. Yeah, thank so you much. guys. And if you haven't stopped by my, my table, I'm going to be celebrities. We're not the only non celebrity in there. Uh, <laughs> And uh, please stop by and say hi, and if you want an autograph, or I also will do voice recording for you for the same fee as an autograph. I'll do your, your answering machine or your, your, uh, your voice note reading, and, and any character you like. So come visit me, say hi. Nice to meet you.